Surprising New Detail About The Rat Pack The Rat Pack was a group of slick-back male heads of industry who became famous for their wild nights on the Las Vegas Strip. They were entertainers, comedians, and occasionally serious actors. But most often than not, you'd find them cavorting about the strip with drinks in their hands and women on their arms, according to legend. The Rat Pack's three main characteristics were their heavy drinking, lavish spending, and womanizing behaviors. And it's this last characteristic that fascinates people 70 years later, especially when one of the group's most talented members is involved. Martin was nicknamed the Cool of King for good reason. His singing and laid-back attitude helped him to become a household name and a popular entertainer, both on stage and in film. Eventually, the Rat Pack's actions led to some juicy rumors. Although it may sound ludicrous now, at the time these sophisticated dancers were considered the epitome of manliness in show business. They exuded a charm that created an appeal with women everywhere. Can you imagine the types of rumors that would follow your father if he ran with a group as notoriously wild as the Rat Pack? Deanna Martin knows this experience firsthand, having grown up hearing stories about her own dad. Although they were once the epitome of cool, she's not so sure that people would look up to them now. When asked if the Rat Pack would have been able to avoid controversy in today's world, Deanna hesitated. I think they would have only because they were so cute at it, she started to say when trailing off, seemingly unable to finish her sentence. He's just being adorable is a popular excuse for bullying in and outside the film industry. However, this previously accepted cuteness no longer flies, and with this in mind, Deanna revisited her position to the question. Being famous or wealthy doesn't mean you can get away with everything. The Friars Club, an invitation-only club mostly for men, has been in the news recently because of its ties to Harvey Weinstein. In the past, it was made more well-known by the Rat Pack. Deanna also understood how crucial the Friars Club is to her family, even if she was unaware of it. The reason Deanna referred to Dean and his relationship with females was because she was recognized by the Friars Club in 2018. So Deanna decided to be upfront. Well, now that I think about it, I'm not sure if they would have survived, she remarked. When it came to her father's hard living and carousing, however, Deanna was adamant about something. The Dean Martin show discredited the swinger in a way that is little short of infuriating. The overly tanned, presumably intoxicated star of the program was Dean. He generally held an old-fashioned glass while on the show, and if he botched a cue card line, he never redid it. Dean was successful, but later his daughter claimed that everything the public knew about him wasn't true. It was all an act designed to deception. Deanna said that the cigarettes and womanizing were simply an act or shtick. It's wildly believed that the glass he constantly held was actually filled with apple juice. She also suggested that Dean was always go with the flow, but would that be accepted today? Deanna's father was always well-liked, but she wasn't sure if that would be enough to protect him from scandal. I'm not certain he would be received by the public these days, she confessed. In contrast, a different rat packer isn't as much of an unknown quantity. Frank would have continued with his plans, she stated, of Frank Sinatra. Dean, by comparison, wasn't going to stay up with Uncle Frank and Uncle Sammy. Yes, he was a lot more family-oriented than everyone realized. Some Rat Pack members even denied the group of Playboy's reputation. I never saw Frank, Dean Martin, or Sammy out of sorts while performing, Joey Bishop, a member of the Rat Pack, said in one interview. According to the comedian, the group's wild reputation was only a gag, Joey added. And do you believe these guys had to chase women? They had to chase them away, as Deanna said. Maybe it truly was an act. My father was a very attractive and debonair man, Deanna said. Every guy aspired to be him, and every woman wanted to be with him. Dean, despite his reputation, was, according to Deanna, considerably different from what people imagined he was. When it comes to whether or not the legendary group will flourish in today's climate, Deanna is more optimistic about the future, especially her own version of her father's legendary celebrity roastings. I've been to these Friar Club roasts, and it gets pretty vulgar, Deanna admitted. For the Deanna Martin celebrity roasts, they apply censorship so that nothing racist or inappropriate is said. For her, being inducted into the Friars Club wasn't something to be ashamed of because it was a sign that she'd made it in Hollywood. We could be the Cat Pack, she said of her joining Liza Minnelli, Barbara Streisand, Dionne Warwick, and Kristen Chenoweth as the only women inducted. With or without this old-fashioned, Dean Martin would probably have been proud of his daughter. 
Another Rat Pack member sparked controversy almost every day in retrospect, but another member of the group's life was filled with controversy. However, Sammy Davis Jr. was born thousands of miles away from Las Vegas' glitter and glamour. His destiny began in Harlem, New York. Since both Davis' dad and mom were in show business, it was only natural that Sammy would follow in their footsteps. He started performing with the rest of his family at a young age. However, in 1943, Davis Jr.'s career was almost forced to change. He was drafted into the United States Army and served as an entertainment specialist. Throughout his time there, he performed for other soldiers. After leaving the military, Davis Jr. returned to the stage circuit. He rejoined his family dance troupe and released a few songs under various aliases. However, something greater was on the horizon. Formerly, in 1959, Davis Jr.'s reputation as a performer had grown to new heights. He was so well regarded that he famously joined the Rat Pack, linking up with Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and several others. The group's shows became such a staple of Las Vegas that legend has it that tourists and high rollers would flock to the Sands Hotel just in hopes of hearing one song or witnessing a witty rejoinder from any number of the iconic performers. The Rat Pack was also popular with the ladies. However, one lady has already caught Sammy's attention a few years earlier. Their relationship, on the other hand, would have its difficulties. On July 29, 1957, at Chez Paris in Chicago, Davis Jr. was having a good time with his buddies. When he looked up from his table, he noticed actress Kim Novak sitting nearby. He was immediately drawn to her beauty. At the time, Novak was at the top of her game. She just appeared in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, and while she didn't enjoy it personally, critics praised her work. At around 10 p.m., the pair met up again at an after-party. The two became fast friends. In fact, some local newspaper reporters were intrigued by their interactions. It didn't take long for them to become the subject of gossip columns. One reporter wondered aloud, which top female is dating which big-name entertainer? Everyone knew who the writer was talking about. Harry Cohn, the head of Columbia Pictures, was alerted to the news and was infuriated at how Novak had chosen to present it. Cohn felt that he had created Novak's image as a Hollywood star, and if the actress was in an interracial relationship, he believed she'd throw away her career and Paramount's share of the profits. He ordered Novak to stop seeing Sammy. In addition to his status as a studio executive, Cohn also had mob connections. Disobeying him was not an option. Novak and Davis Jr. still saw each other, despite the obstacles they were constantly facing. For example, if the pair met at a friend's beach house and Novak showed up as usual, Davis Jr. would hide under a blanket so the press wouldn't see him. Cohn became increasingly enraged with the pair and even employed bodyguards to keep Sammy away from Novak's residence. However, everything failed. Finally, the executive decided to call in the big guns. Sammy Davis Sr. got a call from Mickey Cohen, a crime boss. All he wanted was for Davis Jr. to get a message in Las Vegas. There would be serious ramifications if Davis Jr. didn't marry an African-American woman within 48 hours, according to Cohen. The mob was prepared to snap his legs and take his excellent eye when he wouldn't obey their commands. For once, the singer wasn't amused. Sammy knew the jig was up, and he made quick phone call to singer Lorraine White. The pair had briefly dated, but this time Davis Jr. had a different proposal. Davis bribed White with $10,000 to marry him and act as if they were really married. He explained that once things had calmed down, they'd get a divorce and erase the event from their memories. She accepted, and the two quickly got married at the Sands Hotel. The mob and Cohn were content, and as promised, Davis Jr. and White would divorce not long after. Novak and Davis Jr. continued living their lives after that point, but the couple always remembered their time together fondly. They even managed to have one last sentimental moment when they reunited. In 1990, when Novak visited Davis at the Cedars Sinai Medical Center, he was dying of throat cancer. They were able to properly say goodbye to each other for the last time after years apart. The Rat Pack's lifestyle was glamorous and exciting, but they also made money, became famous, and found love. The city's utter madness, on the other hand, attracted the wrong sort of individuals. Sinatra got entwined in its mess as well. Hailed as one of the greatest entertainers of all time, Frank Sinatra was also a man with a sharp style and a million-dollar smile. But behind his suave exterior, some believed Old Blue Eyes was actually dangerous. It all began in the 1940s when Sinatra mania was sweeping across the United States. Teenage girls swarmed to the young crooner like moths to a flame. And while the craze raged on, another group of people started following just as tightly, the FBI. 
In the FBI's view, the sort of influence Sinatra may have on an audience was hazardous, akin to the blind devotion they were all too familiar with with the result of World War II. But this is merely paranoia. How dangerous can a singer be, after all? However, the FBI tried to dispel their concerns about Sinatra and quickly after he was declared unfit for military service. It was reported that he'd paid a doctor $40,000 to declare him unfit. The whispers couldn't be ignored. Even though the FBI found that Sinatra was legitimately exempt from the tip due to a punctured eardrum and psychological issues, they still didn't trust him. Although Sinatra denied being part of the mafia, his high-ranking friends in the organization painted a different picture of the man. It was Frank Sinatra who supposedly linked mob boss Sam Giancana to John F. Kennedy, according to legend, in an effort to secure union votes for his presidency. As payment for these services, Sinatra performed at Giancana's clubs. Sinatra also introduced Kennedy to Judith Campbell Exner, Giancana's girlfriend, who allegedly became one of JFK's mistresses. She allegedly served as a liaison between Kennedy and Giancana during the CIA's alleged plot to have the Mafia assassinate Cuban President Fidel Castro. But Sinatra's involvement with the Mafia didn't end there. FBI records give accounts of gifts from Chicago gambling bosses Joseph and Charles Fischetti, and Sinatra even performed at the Atlantic City Club on behalf of Philadelphia mobster Angelo Bruno. His own godfather, Willie Moretti, exerted pressure on him to get him out of a contract in 1951. The FBI was constantly monitoring Sinatra's each and every move, such as his numerous meetups with Detroit mobsters Anthony and Vito Giacalone. The data they collected didn't look good for the singer. It was as if he were following a script, said retired FBI agent Sam Ruffino. We'd trail the Giacalones to the airport to collect Sinatra about twice a year. They'd spend time together over the weekend socializing before and after his performances. Almost every night, the cops closed down the venue, Rufino added, and he didn't make any apologies for it. Those were his buddies. The facts that they were notorious hoodlums and murderers were meaningless to him. He didn't care whether people knew who they were. He was going to hang out with whoever he pleased. The FBI weren't the only people who cared, until it was revealed that he had attended a conference in Cuba with infamous mafia members. Then, newspapers published headlines condemning him. Still, Sinatra was never charged with criminal behavior, though his mob ties weren't the only thing the government perceived as a threat. The FBI's file on Sinatra is filled with additional accounts of suspicious activity, most of which revolved around his political sympathies. Sinatra was a proud liberal and often spoke out against systematic racism and discrimination. Some people in Washington were quick to judge him when they found out about his relationship with JFK, going so far as to accusing Sinatra of having communist ties. Sinatra was an outspoken advocate for individuals who were accused of being communist, especially those in Hollywood. He co-founded the Committee for the First Amendment, a group that provided assistance to writers and directors who were blacklisted during the Red Scare. Not only did the FBI use Sinatra's file to incriminate him, but they also used it as a reference for the threats of extortion, blackmail, and violence made against him. After his son was kidnapped in 1963, the Bureau helped advise Sinatra. However, the FBI had been keeping tabs on him since he was a young man. In 1979 and 1980, Sinatra received copies of his file through the Freedom of Information Act, although nothing came of it. It tells a lot of how far the government is prepared to go in order to incarcerate Sinatra that they even bothered with such an elaborate scheme. The FBI file on Frank Sinatra is alarming, wrote historian Gerald Meyer in 2002. It contains nothing that even hints of an activity forbidden by the Bill of Rights. Despite this fact, the Bureau kept Sinatra's file open for almost five decades after he died in 1998, closing it only then. During this time, the FBI amassed a staggering 2,403 pages on every word he spoke and movement he made.